here is Brian Brock from Franklin. Good evening. By now you've heard that a huge natural gas pipeline could run through Sydney by one of these two companies, either Williams or El Paso. Tonight I'd like to bring up to speed on why they want this pipeline, how they would build it, possible consequences for us, and what we could do to protect ourselves. First of all, these are the hundreds and thousands of miles of pipeline that move natural gas around our country. The crowded areas down here are where the gas is produced. The rest is to move the, to uh, bring the gas to the users. As you can see, um, a lot of the gas from the uh, Gulf of Mexico is brought up here to the northeast. Now, this is the part of that pipeline system owned by Kinder Morgan, the largest um, just, uh, pipeline distributor in the country. The lines in here that are in orange are by El Paso, which Kinder Morgan just bought recently. Uh, some of those lines were built by the Tennessee Gas Pipeline Country Company, which El Paso bought several years ago. All of these companies, Kinder, El Paso, Tennessee Gas, have their headquarters down here in Houston. And this is the part of the system that was built by the Tennessee Gas Pipeline Company. Again, it was designed to bring gas from the Gulf of Mexico up into New England. However, things have changed recently. The new techniques of horizontal drilling and switchboard hydraulic fracturing have created huge volumes of gas from the black shales, such as the Marcellus in the Appalachian Basin, as you can see from these production records and these projections. So, as a result, they want a way to move the gas from where it's being produced in Pennsylvania to where it's, been, where it's going to be consumed in New England, and that is this red pipeline here. In particular, they want to move it to all these red dots, which are gas power generators of electricity. <coughs> Therefore, Tennessee Gas Pipeline Company <coughs> proposed building a 36-inch gas pipeline going from Susquehanna, Pennsylvania down here on the uh, number 300 Tennessee pipeline up here to Schoharie County, New York at the number 200 Tennessee gas pipeline. The alternative A in green here was first proposed uh, it avoids going through the Catskill Park down here, which they can't because of restrictions in the New York State Constitution. However, when they presented to the DEC in December, they said that this was going to be more trouble than it's worth because it goes right through the watersheds of the New York City Reservoir System. So they proposed alternative B here in red, which avoids both the Catskill Park and the New York City watershed. This is now the preferred route. Of course, this also goes through Sydney. In choosing pipe routes, these are the sort of lands they try to avoid as much as possible. Wetlands, steep slopes, farmland. As you can see, the second, the later alternative B uses less in total of these. In particular, it uses much less of slopes greater than 20%, but at the expense, the trade-off, of using twice as much prime farmland. The other thing that they try to avoid is developed areas such as villages and cities. Uh, they also try to avoid cr uh, crossings as much as possible, and you can see in general, Route B succeeds that way. Now this is how that route plays out in uh, my town of Franklin. After crossing Route 57 down here below the East Sydney Dam, the route goes up into the hilltops, just being very careful to stay out of the Oswego County, 
come, then comes downhill here, crosses Route 28 below the landscaping buildings, and then proceeds through the hills towards the Charlotte Valley. And you can see they avoid the Old Red Valley here, avoiding the wetlands, the farmlands, and the village of Franklin. Here's the timeline for the project. Uh, it could be, they could begin construction in about a year and a half, and they begin shipping gas by the end of 2014. Now the construction of the came out there, but, uh, the construction of pipelines is regulated by FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Uh, all this process here basically has to do with uh, the where, when, and how of construction. Basically, once the company is able to show that they have the means to construct the pipeline they have signed up enough customers to put the gas in at one end of the pipeline and take it out at the other end of the pipeline, it's a done deal as far as FERC is concerned. Now, if they build the pipeline, what are we going to see? This is a summary of the process. It's an amazingly efficient assembly line process. They survey, cut down all the trees, strip the topsoil off, distribute the pipes along the route. If it's necessary, they will bend the pipes on site, weld them together, dig the trench, lower the pipeline into the trench, cover it up. They will test it after it is in place and then put the topsoil back. Now we'll take a look at each of these steps in detail. This is the first step. They clear a construction easement of 125 feet wide. Trenches dug as deep as eight feet in agricultural lands, four feet of cover, three feet for the pipeline itself, and a foot or so at the bottom for padding. Uh, given the soil here, they're gonna to have to truck in a lot of padding. And up on the hillsides here, they're gonna run into bedrock, which is probably gonna be blasting. Uh, here they will uh, bury the pipeline much shall more shallowly, uh, say about two feet of cover. They will probably trench across our, all our local roads, but, in, but when they get to uh, county and state roads, they will actually use this inclined drill rig and drill the pipeline under the road. Uh, pipes will be brought in by Canadian Pacific, probably to some um, uh, side area, such as somewhere in Sydney. There, they will unload these 80-foot lengths of pipe called joints onto these trucks with that electromagnetic arm. And then they will truck the pipes via state, county, and local roads to the construction site. Uh, at two pipes per load, I estimated for Franklin, we're talking about 3,000 um, trips for the truck just for the pipe alone. Where the terrain is rough, they will use these modified tractors called side booms to spread the pipe along the pipe route. Uh, here they are. Some of the pipes are laid out along the route. Uh, this is the, an illustration from the front page of an article I wrote for our paper, the uh, New Franklin Register. There are copy, fruit copies in the back of the room. Here's a close-up of that. As you can see, that as usual, they line these pipes up in this uh, diagonal uh, pattern. Uh, this is by the Tennessee Gas Pipeline in New company in New Jersey, the same that wants to build the Northeast Extension. And as I said, where they have to, they will actually build, bend these pipes on site. The next step is welding. This is a critical stage for safety of the pipeline. And they have this device inside the pipe, which serves to align and draw the two pieces together. Then after the welds finished, they are all visually inspected, and a portion of them are x-rayed. Um, <coughs> that well should be repaired. However, there's a temptation to cut costs. The new Millennium Pipeline 
was found to be leaking under a creek in, Ti in Tioga County. A well that had failed visual inspection was rejected but used further down the uh, pipeline, waste not, whatnot. Um, after an inspection ordered by FEMSA, um, they found two more leaks and a lot of shoddy record keeping. <coughs> Uh, after inspection, the welds are sandblasted, coated with epoxy to protect the metal from corrosion, and once the pipeline is finished, it's lowered into the trench. Every 10 to 20 miles, they'll install one of these cutoff or block valves. Most of them are manual because they're cheaper than automatic. Unfortunately, that means that someone's going to, have, in case of an emergency, someone's going to have to drive out and crank these down. The closest um, Tennessee Gas Pipeline office is in Sloansville in Schoharie County over an hour away. Um, according to a fire chief at a pipeline fire in Edison, New Jersey back in 94, it took 600 turns of this crank to close it completely, a process that took them almost six hours. Then the trap, which is back filled with dirt, the uh, fill has to be free of any large rocks. So given the condition of the soil up here, that's going to mean a lot more trucking of fill in. We're probably going to need some more gravel pits. Now, after the pipeline is in place, they wait to uh, hydrostatically test it. They pump it up with water to 125%, I think, of the maximum uh, pressure, which in the case of this pipeline would be about 1800 PSI, which is the pressure of a good uh, power washer. Finally, they will landscape the easement. Now, what would this mean for Sydney? Well, the construction is going to be pretty brief. Um, they're talking about completing this pipeline, whole 20, 120 miles of it, in nine months. So we're talking about three miles per week. Uh, so there will be some increased sales during the short time that they're moving through the area. Of course, that's going to be offset by the amount of damage they do to local roads. As far as property tax, well, there be, will be an increase in property tax on the infrastructure they leave behind. I estimated this is a few tens of thousands of dollars a year for the town. But again, that could be offset by the decrease in popular va property values of neighboring properties. Uh, be, they create the permanent easements. They will put in compressor stations. There's the chance of explosion and fires. And it will also facilitate the coming of grass drilling should the, or when the uh, gas prices eventually go up to the point where it's profitable to drill. Um, the trucks will rut the local dirt roads. Weight limit on the uh, substantial state highways is 40 tons. But some of the low boys, trucks carrying the equipment along these roads are going to be twice that. Even worse, they will grind our paved roads to dust uh, because our paved roads lack uh, a stand substantial gravel base. Um, construction along the Millennium Pipeline resulted in $1.2 million in damage to 11 of the, total, the local roads in the town of Cocheston, Sullivan County. The company had bond bonded for only $250,000. The town was eventually able to negotiate for another 125000 that still was leaving the town on the hook for two-thirds of the damages. And of course, the easement will create a 120-mile-long strip of cleared land, a perfect highway for ATVs in summer and snowmobiles in winter. Now, the construction easement is going to be twice the permanent easement. But when they go through forest lands, they don't replant the trees along the side there, leaving the whole 100-foot uh, wide strip open. In fact, they even use herbicides to discourage them. And having the pipeline in your back 40 is a lot less concern than if it's in your backyard. FERC has no required setbacks of pipelines for residences. And you can always spot these pipeline easements because there's nothing on them. You're forbidden to plant trees or even large shrubs. 
and no permanent structures such as houses, patios, decks, garages, pools, or even septic systems. Um, the guidelines require permission for you to do anything more than walk on, mow, or water this ground, even though you own it. In fact, they require you to submit a proposal to their engineering department. After a few weeks, they will get back to you with a letter specifying precisely what you can do. And before you do anything on the property, your own property, you have to sign that and send it back to them. That also gets attached to your deed in the county registrar. Now, these are particularly nasty compressor stations. Uh, there are, in there, there are several um, compressors, each several thousand horsepower, and they run 24 7, 365. Now, this plan for the Northeast Extension does not show any compressor stations along it. They only show an inlet station at the beginning and an outlet station in the end. However, this is, these are only sufficient for the beginning of operation. As the throughput increases and the more, they try to push more and more gas through this pipeline, they have to add booster uh, compressor stations along the way, one every 40 to 80 miles. The uh, Millennium Pipeline, which is only a few years old now, the uh, company is about to build a booster compression station in Minisink, Orange County, which is just southeast of Port Jervis, and they've already sighted a second one in Hancock, only 60 miles away from the first. And then these compressor stations have a persistent slow leak of methane and other gases. Uh, you can't see it in the visual. These arrows indicate where they've seen it leaking out. But if you look at infrared, you can see these greenhouse gases coming out of the pipes. And also, if the uh, compressor station has to shut down for any reason, such as power outages, maintenance, or damage, there's a, they have to have a blowdown of huge volumes of gas before they can start operating again. Downwind syndromes have included thing, reports of such things as headaches, nosebleeds, and rashes. The ceaseless noise can make things miserable for the neighbors day and night. And they also explode. This was back in March in Pennsylvania. The roof blew off this building. Despite uh, Pennsylvania DEP's orders, the station was up and running the next day. But they discovered that in rural areas, the state has no oversight of these compressor stations. This uh, compressor station was built by Cabot and run by Williams. More about them later. Now, FERC classifies <coughs> land according to how developed it is. And the less developed it is, which would be most of us in class one up here, uh, the less stringent the regulations. For example, the fewer percentage of welds that have to be x-rayed and the higher maximum percentage that they can run the pressure of the pipeline. And when the pipeline fails, the results can be tragic. Here, two homes were reduced to cinder and five people were burned. This is the 30-inch Transco pipeline run by Williams. And here's some calculations on what the um, area of fire damage is. Uh, we're talking 30, 36 inch pipeline at this pressure, so we're talking about hundreds of feet. Now this is a little pessimistic. This is the absolute limit of fire damage and most of the um, death and injury at these pipeline explosion and fires are within 200 feet of the pipeline. But then of course remember that there is no minimum setback from homes from these pipelines. And it tur uh, tragically, at least half of these accidents are unnecessary. Uh, defective welds material, corrosion, either allowed to happen or not repaired in operator error, are all within the scope of the pipeline company to prevent. Now, how uh, expensive are these damages? Uh, we're talking about, say, average across here, 275 accidents, as they call them, incidences, 
a year at a cost along this line of, say, over $100 million a year. And how dangerous? We're talking about, again, averaging across here, say, about 15 fatalities a year and, oh, say, 200 or so accidents. Now, these are for all pipeline systems, but you have to figure that most of the deaths and injuries are to do with the pipeline, gas pipeline explosions. Um, once the pipeline is up and running, the regulatory authority passes from FERC to the, to the federal DOT, the Department of Transportation, whose agency is FEMSA, the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration. And they deputize, uh, if the states want it, the local state agency, which in New York is our Public Service Commission, the PSC. Uh, how good a job do they do it? Well, here's a, the federal government's own rating of the various states' pipeline organizations. Uh, it has, um, they, they're rating the various services that this uh, PSC offers from zero terrible to three good, and then it gives them a uh, average score down here in the last column. There's good news and bad news for us. For New York, we rate in the top 10. The bad news is we do that with a score of 1.5, only 50%. <laughs> we're in the top 10 not because we're so good, but because the vast majority of the states are so bad. Okay, so what can Sydney do uh, to uh, protect itself? Uh, it could have a road use ordinance, uh, check about gravel pits, compressor stations. It's not clear if building codes are going to be allowed. Uh, the federal regulations may preempt that. Zoning ordinance would be useful, and a landowner's coalition. Uh, eminent domain, once the uh, pipeline company gets the uh, permission, it has the power of eminent domain. Uh, this is bad for both sides because of the legal expenses. It's bad for the landowners because this only deals with price. You're stuck with all the terms of the uh, company's lease. Bad publicity for the company. Now, I won't go into this. These are all the things you want to watch out for in the leasing agreement. Okay, uh, when and where this pipeline is going to be built has been complicated by the second pipeline constitution. This was, this, uh, was proposed only two weeks after the uh, Northeast Extension project became general knowledge. It looks kind of generalized and hasty. A couple weeks later, they came out with this more refined route which looks very much like the Northeast Extension. Uh, again, it would take gas from the William Transco pipeline, which is designed to move gas from the coast, uh, coast up to the Northeast. Uh, here are the two pipelines side by side. There's the roofs of the Northeast Extension. There's the roofs of the Constitution Pipeline. It seems very much that uh, Constitution has, dropped, has managed to hijack the Northeast Extension Pipeline. Here's a map of the uh, Constitution Pipeline going through Delaware County. As you can see, they stay to the hillside tops and stay out of the valleys and uh, away from the towns. Here are a couple of close-ups of the route map through Sydney. And further here, going below the uh, Brookings 357 here, below the East Sydney Dam, and going up into the hills above the Oilwood Valley. Uh, it doesn't seem to make much difference to us which of these two companies succeed because this is the timeline for the Constitution. They're still talking about breaking ground in April and finishing up less than a year later. And that's about it. Yeah, and those are some of the websites you can go to for more information.